saved Europe. Sunday night on Montana PBS. I can see myself in Nathan's shoes, taking that wrong turn, being influenced. I'm just trying to not let this tear me apart. The kid almost took everything away from me. Medical bills, surgeries. I'm in debt, serious debt. Maybe I'm searching for something in him, some remorse. I don't know. Is there hope? Monday evening at 9. This is the PBS Video app. Install it on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or other streaming device, and use it to access more of the PBS shows you love. But if you're looking for even more shows to binge like this, or early access to shows like this, then look for this icon. That's the PBS Passport icon, and it means that video is part of PBS Passport. Passport is our way of saying thank you to our station members. Donate to your local PBS station today, and one of the member benefits you'll receive is PBS Passport, which offers extended access to a growing library of new and favorite PBS programs. You can support your station and your community by becoming a member today. Visit pbs.org slash getpassport for details. Watch PBS Passport anytime on any screen, wherever you stream. It's your ticket to the best of PBS. On Cool the Midwife. We've been hearing reports about an accident. Is everything all right? No, Mrs. Turner. I'm afraid it is not. Nancy, we're on the train. I was with Sister Julianne and Dr. Turner. I don't know where they are. The embankment's on fire. There's people trapped. What will befall us if he does not return? The Nata's house will sink and we will drown. Tonight at 7. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Welcome to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very vibrant campus of Montana State University and coming to you over the Montana Public Television System. I'm Jack Riesman, retired professor of plant pathology, happy to be your host this evening. But before we go any farther, in the words of Hayden Ferguson, happy Mother's Day to all of you out there who qualify. And those of you who don't qualify, have a nice day anyway. That was Hayden's favorite line. And Hayden sat in this chair for a lot of years, passed away just a couple years ago. Uh, interesting program tonight. As you all know, we are doing a series on women in agriculture. And when I started in 1979, back in the dark ages here in Montana, we had maybe one, and I remember hiring a second female ag extension agent. Right now we have maybe half of them in the state are female, and that's great. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel, and then we'll go back to our guest this evening, and she'll tell us a little bit about what she does. But starting way on my left is Yuta McKelvey. Yuta is a plant pathologist here with the Extension Service, very knowledgeable. If you have questions tonight about diseases, Hey, it's an excellent opportunity to call them in 
It's going to warm up. We're going to have disease problems in no time at all. So get your questions in. Nancy Blake, and the phone number will be on the screen in a little bit. And get those questions coming in. Shelly, welcome to Bozeman. I know it's hard to leave Valley County, but thanks for driving down. Tell us about what you do in Valley County. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, an honor and pleasure to be here tonight. So what I do is agricultural work. Uh, that includes in crops, crop production, livestock production, horticulture questions. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is my beekeeping workshops. So we uh, have quite a few things that extension agents do in the agricultural world world you do a ton of stuff i mean you've got 4-h you've got county fairs yes. horticulture but i want to see a little bit about this bee project you have up there that's fascinating to me and bees are always a good topic yeah. so if we can roll the film and see what we have on bees uh, that should be up here in a second so this is my new, brand new beekeeping learning laboratory that I've put in with, uh, in collaboration with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at Fort Peck, Montana. I'm placing five hives out there that I will use to teach people hands-on beekeeping measures. I've been teaching beekeeping workshops for about six years now, and I noticed that people were missing key concepts about beekeeping things like you have to leave all the frames in there or they build burr comb, which is really hard to extract. <laughs> and uh, so I got an instructional innovation grant from the Center for Faculty Excellence and purchased the hives. And then I got a Western SARE grant to purchase the bees. And I just hived them last Monday, this last Monday. There you go. On that note, we had a <laughs> call in or a uh, email from a guy that I know out there, Jeff Robinson with the Army Corps of Engineers. I've known Jeff for quite a few years. He's a great guy up there. He'd like to have you talk a little bit about the pollinator garden in cooperation with the Corps of Engineers. Sure. So I've been working with uh, a couple of people at the Corps of Engineers, Patricia Gilbert Ball and Sue Dalby, who is the director of the Interpretive Center. And we're putting in a 23-acre pollinator plot around the Interpretive Center. And uh, we got some money, some funding through the Army Corps of Engineers, and we are going to have it in five different phases. We'll have mesic areas, and then we'll have xeric areas as well. So some areas that'll be wetlands that we will be able to irrigate from the Missouri River, and then a good, good portion of it will be uh, xeric, which is dry land. Okay, a plug for Fort Peck. Uh, if you haven't seen the Interpretive Center, at Fort Peck. It is absolutely beautiful and the history of Fort Peck uh, is incredible. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for a weekend vacation, uh, take a drive up to Glasgow. Pretty country up there. Uh, Jane, a question from Twin Bridges. Is a hound's tongue weevil found in the Ruby River drainage? Mm -hmm. What is the hound's tongue weevil? Anyway? Yeah, so uh, there is a root feeding <coughs> weevil uh, that uh, is a it's a, a, a pest of hound's tongue. A hound's tongue is one of our noxious weeds, and this is kind of an inter interesting story in the biocontrol realm because this is an insect that was not approved for release in the U.S., but it was approved in Canada, um, just across the northern border, where it's done a wonderful job on hound's tongue, and it has moved on its own uh, across the border and. Um, is in a, a dozen or so counties in Montana. And it, I'm not sure if it's up the Ruby River per se, but it is in Madison County. And um, I know it's in the Cardwell and the Pony area. Um, and it, it could be up kind of the Ruby River drainage, but we just haven't seen it yet. Uh, we are doing some research on that with uh, Melissa Maggio with the Montana Biocontrol project and monitoring where it is and what sort of impact it's having on hound's tongue and also if it's having any impact on native borage species. That's one of the reasons it was not approved for release in the U.S. is uh, it did feed on some native borages in the southern part of the country and um, was not approved but it is moving on its own and it, it's very effective on hound's tongue. 
Is Hound Stung found statewide? My dogs seem to find it wherever they go. Yeah, it is found statewide. Um, it's even, I know up in northeastern Montana, it's one of the newer invaders for noxious weeds. Does it like higher moisture situations? Mm, I don't think so. I, not, okay. I mean, I've seen it in a lot of different places and I, I don't think it's tied to moisture. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in tonight. We'll get to those as we go along. I have one left over from last week, and this person from Bozeman would like to know when's the best time to aerate their lawn. So now is a good time to aerate your lawn. Usually, when it's um, you know things are greening up, it's cool season. It's a good time to aerate. Um, it's also a good time to overseed your lawn if you are wanting to revitalize some of those patchy areas that don't have that really nice you know um, filled in turf grass. So aerating your lawn now is good. It's just not a good idea to do that in the summer months. Okay, uh, Can I Yuda. Can a question? Sure. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Aerating the lawn, already working on that. When mm -hmm. is a good time to fertilize my lawn? That's a great question and good timing for that, Uta. Um, fertilizing your lawn, if there's like a nice um, handy guide where you can talk about in terms of holidays. Um, so you want to um, fertilize your lawn usually around Memorial Day and then again Labor Day and then um, Columbus Day. So about three times a year, those are your, your go-to marks for fertilizing. So while we're on the lawn thing, what about uh, dethatching lawns? What's everybody's opinion? And then I'll get my two cents in. <laughs> yeah, um, so I personally, um, dethatching can be quite an intensive procedure for your lawns and a lot of times um, the thatch buildup isn't usually high enough in most situations to warrant dethatching in my opinion and from what I've seen. So I usually opt for aerating instead. Do you guys have other thoughts on that? Okay. I, I don't like what's, it. What's your, yeah, I, I don't <laughs> usually recommend it either. No, I, to me it does more damage. Yes. It does. And I am a big fan of aeration versus dethatching. Absolutely. And aeration, you have to have somebody else do it and dethatching. You know, that might be hard work. So yeah. I avoid that if possible. <laughs> All right, Yuda uh, from Haver. Actually, we have a question from Haver and also Malta regarding some yellow and drying wheat, winter wheat, in their rolls. Any idea what might be causing this? Mm, yeah, I think that's a, it, could, it is probably winter kill, like this would be the time of the year where that would show. So winter kill happens to your winter crops, or in this case winter wheat, when, you know, they're kind of stressed going into winter. Often, you know, I mean, particularly in Montana, northern Montana, we had a, a severe drought situation, so there's a good chance those wheat plants haven't gotten, you know, enough moisture. Maybe they were also seeded very late okay. due to the lack of moisture and didn't get enough chance to establish before the winter. And then not a lot of snow cover this winter either, so they're kind of exposed to those cold temperatures and all of these things can really take a number on the wheat. So probably these brown patches are winter kill. And um, You'll just have to see what recovers and you know what might stay that this is the time where it starts showing and we'll see how bad it's going to be. Okay. Shelly, you know, when I used to work for a living, uh, <laughs> Valley <laughs> County was a big spring wheat producing county, and they still are. Has winter wheat moved into Valley County? Occasionally, you'll have growers that'll, that are optimistic. If we get moisture in the fall, then they'll try to do a, a winter wheat, but it's not a very big crop. We're primarily spring wheat, but we've gone mostly into the pulse crops, which are peas, chickpeas, and lentils. And we do almost continuous crop. And in the 30 years that I've been there, they have switched from wheat fallow to continuous crop, no-till or conservation tillage, and uh, including uh, canola and flax and we even have sunflower <laughs> cover crops. You know, we're, we're trying everything we can to make the most of the small amount of moisture that we have. But it's, it's a much more sustainable system now than it was 30 years ago. I agree. Uh, question, this person has been driving around the state of Montana has noticed a lot of goat farms. 
And actually, we had John Helley from Dillon on a couple of years ago. And at that time, he told us that Montana is one of the biggest exporters of goat to the Colorado region where they utilize a lot of goat meat. So yeah, it is a big business, especially in Yellowstone County, and possibly also I've seen them down in Bighorn County. So it is an expanding industry. Um, Abby from Helena, the outer bark is peeled off her pear tree, exposing the inner bark. What should they do? I would, yeah, <laughs> I would say I would say it depends on how extensive it is, um, but don't apply anything on it like any tars or, or tree paints or tree wound covers. Let it um, see if it'll heal on its own and, and just kind of watch it over the course of the summer and just see how it does um, and uh, take it from there. Sometimes trees can survive if it's not extensive damage all the way around the trunk. Okay. What, what causes that? It, it could be, I think, pests like deer and stuff that mm. could be chewing on the bark mm -hmm. or mechanical damage or something like okay. that. So it's, it's, yeah, it could be a variety of different okay. things. Okay. You know, I, sorry, okay. I just keep throwing things in, but I saw a picture the other day of a tree where the bark was removed at the base of the tree and it was kind of a what happened here diagnostic quest, but it turned out it's like per, people with lawnmowers going too close by the tree Mm -hmm. and really severely damaging yeah. the trees. So as the, green is, the lawn is yeah. greening up and we're thinking about mowing again, be sure to give some room around your trees to not damage yeah. them. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point too. A lot of times I'll recommend people don't let the turf grow all the way up mm -hmm. to the base of their trees because when you have, you know, that closeness to the turf and you're using your weed whacker or a lawnmower, I like to call it lawnmower yeah. blight, mm -hmm. that injury to the trees. <laughs> Um, um, make sure you, you kind of pull, pull your turf out and you can mulch the area around it instead mm -hmm. so you're not tempted to get in there. But that's yeah, a really that's good, a good point. Trick, yeah. Okay, thank you. From Shelby, this person would like to know if the county extension agents, ag agents, or home ec agents help with uh, natural disasters or local disasters, including drought relief and so on. Absolutely, we try our best to bring, be forward thinking and anticipate what will be the things that are coming in the future. Like this year is for Northeast Montana and, and a lot of Eastern Montana, uh, gonna be another drought year. And so we're trying to do a lot of drought um, programming and education. How can they do alternative feeds? Um, grasshoppers are gonna be a big issue. Another thing is people are bringing in hay from all over the nation and paying a premium price for it. And one of the things that we wanna make sure that they do is check their feed grounds and look for any unusual weeds, particularly Palmer, Palmer amaranth, which is really, if we get it in the state of Montana, it's gonna just devastate us. So if you see a weed that's growing really rapidly, call your extension agent because we wanna be on top of that. But we also do nitrate testing of small grain forages for people in our offices. It's free. And it used to be a, a yes, no answer. We just had an acid test that, yeah, it's there. We don't know how much is there, but it's there. But now we actually have a new strip method. It takes longer, uh, but we can give you a range. And if it's in a certain higher level, we actually will say, hey, we need to send this to the laboratory to get a, an, an analytical number for you on it. So yeah, we are trying to do as best we can with with drought, fire, we are helping people with fire mitigation, weed management and fire. Jane does a lot of that. Um, flooding, yeah, we're there. You're busy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will put a plug in for the county extension agents. They do a great job. And, you know, with all these people moving in the state, they really don't have an appreciation for agriculture, much less gardening. The county agents and all these counties, all 52, 56 counties, can provide assistance, and they're more than happy to do it, right? Absolutely, and we provide assistance even if you only own 20 acres or two acres or just a lot. You know, we help you with the horticulture questions. We're the people on the, on the field, out in the field, and you call us, we will come to your house and we will look at your plants. And if we don't know the answer, we will send them to the specialists here at MSU. And we work very closely with the Scudder Diagnostic Lab on a lot of things. I agree with you. Okay, thank you. This is a new one to me uh, from Hamilton. Can Jane talk about new noxious weed 
Cubosa grass, replacing cheatgrass. You ever heard of it? C U L B O S A? Oh, I think it's uh, Poa bulbosa. Okay. Which is bulbous bluegrass. Yes, I can talk about it. I actually brought some. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was kind of anticipating a question about bulbous bluegrass because it's uh, one of the grasses greening up right now. And um, it, it is, uh, it, it's a little bunch grass. So this is kind of what it's looking like right now, um, growing fairly flat to the ground. And uh, if you separate these kind of these tillers, what we call tillers, you'll see that it has uh, bulbs at the base of the plant. Hopefully that's showing up, yeah, which is where up. its name comes, uh, Poa bulbosa. As it, uh, probably within a couple weeks, this is here in, in Bozeman, we're always a couple weeks behind other parts of the state. This call came from Hamilton, I think. They're yeah, usually ahead right. of us. It'll start shooting up its flowering stems and uh, the, name, the bulbous bluegrass becomes important again too because instead of producing seeds, this plant actually produces, they're called bulbils. It's, I've heard it described as the only plant that gives uh, live birth. <laughs> but instead of seeds, those little bulbils are actually immature plants and they fall to the, the ground and they're ready to grow, grow right away. Mm. Um, so now is the time to be managing this plant. Um, once it starts getting those flower heads, uh, it's harder to manage. Uh, if this is a, a pa it, it's mostly a problem in you know pastures and rangeland, and we're still learning about the best way to manage uh, bulbo, uh, poa bulbosa or bulbous bluegrass. But some of the work that's coming out of the University of Wyoming, they've been doing some different trials, uh, suggests that you can treat it this time of year when it's just the little bunches with a mazepic. Um, sometimes a mazepic plus glyphosate, so uh, that treatment will work. You will see some injury to your other grasses, especially if you put the glyphosate in there. Um, Katie Hatlilid, who is our extension agent in Judith Basin County, she and I have been corresponding over the last couple of years. She has some producers up there that are dealing with this, and they had used uh, sulfur sulfuron, which is sold as landmark for range and pasture and had like 80% control and we're very happy with, with the control that they got. But it is very critical to treat it now. Um, and it's kind of a, I mean, you know, this just looks like any old grass. It's, it's kind of a, a non-distinct plant and people don't really notice it till it's, they start seeing the, the bulbils on the, the flower heads. So treat it now. Okay. You got the word from Jane. Now's yeah. the time to do it. Now is the time. Okay, uh, Shelly from Creston. Uh, this person says Montana farms are getting bigger, but there's been a huge influx of people who have purchased small acres, acreages. Uh, does Extension have any programs to work directly with these people that are buying 10, 20, 30, 40 acres? Absolutely. They've been really um, forward thinking on our small acreage farms. So you have a, a farm that's 20 acres and you have a weed issue. Who do you call? Well, you call Extension and Extension comes out and helps you identify the weed, helps you figure out how to manage it. We offer both chemical methods and organic methods depending on what your preference is. And uh, Western Montana is really gone a long way with it. Um, Patrick Mangan out of Missoula has done some amazing things with the small farm acreages. And I know Kimberly Richardson in, in Hamilton has done as well. In Eastern Montana, we, we still have pretty large <laughs> farms, you know, 10,000 acres or so, but. Exactly. You know, uh, phones have quieted down, folks. If you have questions, hey, you might get them answered tonight. So <laughs> the phone number's on the screen, give us a call and we'll get the questions answered. Yuda. Uh, <laughs> I know what happened here. From Bozeman, this person has some daffodils that they think have powdery mildew because it has white bands on the leaves. Um, any idea if that is powdery mildew? It seems a little early for powdery mildew and a little, especially a little cold if, you know, if there's not a lack of moisture. It certainly hasn't been warm enough. Um, I think those white 
uh, areas are probably cold damaged. You know, it's been very cold. We had a couple of nice little snowstorms here and some really cold temperatures. And uh, I think the daffodils being like early bloomers, they had their foliage out and they probably, even though they should be adapted to cold temperatures, not as cold as it happened to be in the cup last couple of weeks. So it's probably some bleaching from frost damage. Um, I mean, if they're blooming, they're probably fine. It's not that pretty, but <laughs> I think they'll make it, hopefully. <laughs> I think they will. Mm -hmm. It could even be snow <laughs> on the foliage, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, if you can <laughs> rub it off, then <laughs> it's snow. If it's <laughs> cold and wet, yeah. it's probably snow. <laughs> okay, as a follow-up question, this is an interesting one. It's from Townsend. Their tulips started to bloom, and the next day there was no blooms left on them. Why? <laughs> Who wants to I have a guess, but I bet yeah. Abby. <laughs> I mean, I do too. Um, I think either something ate them or, um, yeah, uh, deer. something I've, knocked yeah, them Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Uh, yeah. If you have deer in the neighborhood, uh, they love tulips. Tulips and, are tasty. Yeah, to yeah deer. that's one of their favorite foods. So, mm -hmm. no doubt they'll come in and clip the heads off and they'll wait for the next bloom and come back again. <laughs> At least you got a day of bloom out of that. Yeah, you know? that that's true. Yeah. Um, you know, I have you up. Do you think this cold spring will increase or decrease the potential okay. for cereal crop diseases? Okay. Kelly, you can jump in too. What do you guys think? We're late this year. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think especially in like the Bozeman area and where it's also wet right now, the cold and wet is cause for concern. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, you know, seedling diseases. If it's like spring, for like spring planted crops that really like that cold and wet and they're gonna go after your uh, seeds and seedlings. Um, so that's something to be on the lookout for. And, you know, Shelly, you grow a lot of pulse crop. I, mean, I don't think you have the moisture up there. But no. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, as you're planting pulses and, you know, the moisture is welcome, right? But planting pulses into wet, cold soils, uh, they need protection from a seed treatment because otherwise there are these uh, root rots like Pythium root rot that are really just waiting uh, for some innocent little seedlings to come out there. So. I think there is cause for concern. Um, yeah, I but agree. the good thing is seed treatments are really effective. So if you know if you still have time to apply seed treatment, if you haven't already, that's definitely a good strategy. On that note, we do have, and Chile can jump in on this. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we're at at Valley County, but I know a lot of the peas are normally in by this time of year. Mm -hmm. But some areas of the state, especially eastern part of the state, and this person from Manhattan has not been able to get their peas in. Is it too late? No, uh -uh. I think after about the 15th of May for peas, it's a little late. They are a cool season crop, but it's certainly don't want to be seeding peas in June. That's mm -hmm. way too late. But. Um, if you have temperatures above 80, it aborts the blossoms and they'll, yep. they'll flower at that time. Yep, so if uh, it's hot in August, oh, yes. July, no. <laughs> yeah, actually, last time I was up there in August, I saw 103 degrees in Glasgow. We never used to see that. That's for sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jane, from Miles City, is Goldhead weed present in the Bozeman area? You might explain what mm. Goldhead is. Yeah, is what is goat? <laughs> uh, go yeah, I think it is the same thing as puncture vine. Um, puncture vine, so the places where we see that most in the state are Yellowstone County, and I think down into Carbon County, so Billings, and then down towards Red Lodge and to the east. Uh, I have never seen it in the Bozeman area. I could, that call I think came in from Mile City. I could see where you might find it in Mile City. It likes a little hotter and drier than uh, Southwest Montana. Yeah, I would agree with you. Uh, from Billings, I don't understand why somebody wants to get a, get rid of Lily of the Valleys, but anybody have an idea how you would get rid of Lily of the Valleys? Yeah, you can use glyphosate and get rid of it that way, but it, it's, a, it's a nice plant for pollinators too, so. Um, but if, if it's growing somewhere where you don't want it, you can use glyphosate and get rid of it that way. Okay. Any Abby, would, do you think uh, covering the ground with like black plastic in the area would work? So or? I've had kind of mixed um, 
results with that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear your opinion, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I don't know if, um, you know, if it would work, it would work to maybe kill that current crop, but if they wanted to get rid of it from the area, it would probably regrow from there. Okay. So I don't yeah. know how well, you know, that heat will get into the soil and affect the seeds. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this question came in from Manhattan, and they'd like to know, does Mon Montana have a litter law? Uh, the interstate from Bozeman to Logan looks like a city <laughs> landfill on the westbound lane, and I agree with that. Who is responsible for enforcement? We don't have anybody that answers that here. I do know we have a litter law, but I, I'm not sure who's enforcing it. And yes, uh, we do have a lot of trash along the interstate right now. Um, and I'm guessing that's because they're the taking loads to the landfill, yeah. right? That's mm. why it's so mm. exactly. litter, so much litter strewn along I-90 between here and Logan. It is a mess. You know, while I've got this here, I got to, you know, Jane is very, very knowledgeable about weeds and so forth. But if I can get a picture of this, she's also a very good cook. And we invite her all the time because she always brings in treats. And this particular one is butter caramels with sea salt. And wow. I'll bet you there'll be none left after the program. And Jane, <laughs> thank you for doing that. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, uh, Shelley, I did not know this, but this person from Billings said they heard on the news that the national county agents will meet in Montana in 2025. Tell us a little bit more about that, if you would. Well, it's an interesting process. The National Association, if you belong to the Montana Association of County Ag Agents, you belong to the National Association of County Ag Agents. And it takes, once every eight years, the conference is held in the Western United States. And about six years ago, Montana said, eh, we kind of would like to host it. So we kind of talked about it, brought it back to our association and brought it back to Extension Director Cody Stone. And, and everybody was in agreement that it's a great opportunity to bring agents together and do some um, team building. And so we went back and made a bid, and we were accepted. And we will be hosting the National Association of County Ag Agents in 2025. We expect somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people. Wow. It will be in Billings. Wow. So it's, it's pretty exciting. That is great. It's, it's good for Montana. It yeah. really is. The yeah. last time we held it was in 1982, and um, Dave Phillips was the chair at the time, so I'm the chair and Patrick Mangan is my co-chair. And Shelley, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, it's a challenge to find a venue mm -hmm. big enough to host that many people from across the country, correct? That is correct, and Montana, the whole population of Montana is less than a lot of the places that have hosted in the past, and Montana has no convention center. So we had to go to the national board with special compensation to reduce the agenda to cut it a day out and then we actually had an offer from the Idaho agents saying hey we want you to keep the spouses tour and the sons and daughters tour which is a whole nother track beyond <laughs> professional development and they said we are willing to to do that for you we will come to Montana and and run that track for you which was amazing so thank you to Scott Jensen and the Idaho agents for that that's great I like that uh, from Wolf Point, kind of up in your territory, mm -hmm. they had a grass fire in 2021 on part of a CRP field. It didn't grow last summer because of the drought, understandable, but he thought it would come back this year, but it has not. The area not burned has greened up. It is planted to alfalfa and tall wheatgrass. <laughs> Any explanation? I think it was probably drought related. Uh. We just like had three inches of moisture all last year. So, and we normally are low, nine to 11 inches is our normal. And uh, it's just un uncanny that uh, we have had absolutely no moisture and the rains have gone around us, south of us, north of us. So I would say, hold on, we did get some moisture this last weekend and hopefully that will green it up. The alfalfa should come and the grasses should come, but be aware that there's gonna be the likelihood of weeds in there as well. Yeah, I agree with you there, okay. Uh, from Glasgow, your country, is milkweed considered invasive, noxious, or both? Should it be encouraged for pollinators? Jane? Well, I think everyone on the panel can probably say something about that. 
Milkweed is not a noxious weed. It's actually a plant that's native to Montana, and Montana will not list a native plant on the noxious weed list. It's, it's kind of aggressive, but I wouldn't call it invasive by any means. I, I love milkweed, and I'll let the others comment about its value as a pollinator resource. Mm -hmm. yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it is an important pollinator resource for our honeybees and uh, monarch butterf butterflies as well. Mm -hmm. We're kind of on the edge of the range, isn't that right, We Abby? are on the edge yeah. of the range, yeah. yeah. You know, I noted something last year, and I, I think I probably mentioned it on the program, but I was out in the eastern part of the state and driving along the interstate in the summertime, whoever mowed the interstate was courteous enough to mow around the milkweeds. Now, I don't think that's a statewide program, but it just tells you that a lot of people are concerned about pollinators and they took the time to mow around. And it's kind of unique to drive down the interstate at 80 mile an hour and see nothing but milkweeds. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Yeah, anyway. there, there's actually, I think it's 12 species of milkweed in Montana. You know, some are more showy than others, mm -hmm. but there's actually quite a few species out there. And, you know, they are very important for monarch butterflies, which yeah. are in peril. So mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. they're an am amazing plant that yeah. has a lot of value. One thing you do need to be careful for, they can be toxic yep. to livestock. Mm -hmm. So if they're growing in an area where you have livestock grazing, that's something to keep in mind, but overall really awesome plant for pollinators. Yeah. Difficult to control as well because of the thick uh, waxy layer on there. So you have to, na have, to have an adjuvant mm -hmm. in your mix to yep. get through that. And soap works as an adjuvant, right? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to, I mean, Dawn's pretty reasonable compared to some of the adjuncts, and I couldn't say that, but it is. Okay, uh, Yuda from Park City, their mature spruce has spots on the needles, and the needles drop off, and the branches seem to be dying. What could be the cause? Would that be cytosphere possibly? causing that? Ah. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say, like, okay, you just, you just, okay, I'm just not good with the, the tree <laughs> thing. So, like, you take it from me before I throw, throw the diagnostic lab under the bus once again. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was going to say um, there are a few fungal um, pathogens that affect spruce trees that show those little dots, and one of them is rhizosphera needle cast. But a good thing to know would be to, to send a sample into the diagnostic clinic to confirm what it might be depending on, on where you see those spots on the needles, whether it's the old growth or a new growth, it could be a different pathogen. So I would, I would um, send a sample to the diagnostic clinic um, to have that confirmed. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Um, Wanda from Yellowstone County has an uh, old pasture that is not doing very well. And she's curious if using a cover crop instead of going back into a pasture would be suitable. And my suggestion would be to get a hold of last week's guest, uh, Kate Vogel at Kate Vogel at uh, Northern, what is North, it? North 40 Ag. North 40 Ag com in uh, Ballantyne. And she can definitely answer your question there. Ah, this is fun. From Shelby, what is the best time to pick dandelion leaves for edible salads, before mm -hmm. or after bloom? Finally, somebody that likes <laughs> dandelion. <laughs> yeah. I love dandelion. <laughs> But I mean, I would probably say before bloom because you'll have like that bitter kind of um, fibrous taste probably after it blooms in the leaves. Um, I, I mean, I have never um, eaten dandelions in my salad. I've, I've tried to cook dandelion heads, but I'm, I'm curious, have you, you guys ever tried? I have not. Well, I've no, tried them. Yeah. They, they're kind of a little tart, mm -hmm. but yeah. Bitter uh, definitely, is the word. Definitely if you get them young, they're way better than the older after they've bloomed. Mm -hmm. Purslane, your Purslane fan too? <laughs> ah, that one makes me mad in the garden. I just want to pull it. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, poor Jane, uh, this is from Bozeman. They say they have heard Jack call Canada thistle the Bozeman city flower. <laughs> <laughs> and there is some truth to that. Uh, they are curious, what can they do 
because there are so many Canada thistles in lots and land waiting for development that are not controlled and they contaminate this person's lawn. What can they do? Yeah, um, if it's in an area that's being developed and, you know, I, I would suggest talking to the county weed district. Um, developments do require a weed management plan. Uh, that's part of the County Noxious Weed Control Act. And the, the weed district folks would be the best people to know if there's a plan in place and who is responsible for implementing that plan. Okay. Uh, in other words, get a hold of some management and shake the table a little bit. You might have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Uh, a question from Glasgow. If Jane wanted to do weed control research in Valley County, Shelley, do you help her or do you line it up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit of both. When we uh, had a producer come into our office in 2010 with a weed in his hand and said, what is it and how come I can't kill it with 16 ounces of Roundup? Um, people started to get a little concerned and it started to spread. And so I contacted Jane and a couple of weed scientists from MSU and North Dakota State University as well. We did a bunch of research on it and found out that it was uh, narrowleaf hawksbeard, which was identified by Noel Orloff of the Scudder Lab. And we researched many different ways to control it in both the cropland and in range and pasture. And as a matter of fact, Jane and I did a, a couple of research projects with Bobby Ross, who was the Daniels County agent. And that was my master's thesis. Mm -hmm. And um, we came up with different ways to manage narrowleaf hawksbeard. And I sent out a survey to the growers and asked how much money we had saved them by doing this education and outreach. And they said anywhere from 40 to $83 an acre. So roughly around $6 million in Northeast Montana that we've saved by helping them prevent this crop from invading their weeds, or invading this plant from invading their crops. And that's a nasty there. one too. Well, it's, it is and it isn't. It's a winter annual, so it, was some, it fits really well into the no-till situation, which is where winter annuals really succeed well. Right. And it just was a new invader to our area. It was common in, in Canada, common in Alaska, uh, but it just, it was like the all perfect storm where it met in Montana and uh, people are able to control it very effectively now. Good. You know, you mentioned Palmer Amaranth. That's in North Dakota now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How close to the Montana border? It's still quite a, quite a ways, about half the state over, but it's, it's there and it's, millet is one of the areas that they think yeah. brought it in, yeah. uh, most likely because it can't be cleaned out of millet very well. But hay was brought in on hay. So it's also been moved in conservation planting yeah. seed mixes. In Minnesota, that's how it was introduced. So we have to be very cautious. Yeah, yeah. Jack, okay. may I say one sure. other thing about the, the question about research? I think one of the neat things about the extension system is that there's specialists on campus and then agents out across the state. And when something like narrowleaf hawksbeard shows up in, it's kind of a, a unique situation in one part of the state, that's a great opportunity for agents and specialists to work together mm -hmm. to address a regional or local need. And then it's also great for specialists on campus. We hear what the issues are in the state from the agents. And you know they, they help to keep us abreast of what's going on out there. And then we can work together to try to develop resources to address those, those needs. It's worked very well over time. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Uh, moving along, um, this person would like to know if the oyster mushroom is relatively safe to eat. And the answer is yes. <laughs> and if this is a time of year where the oyster mushroom shows up on dead cottonwoods. And uh, it does make great soup. You know, I might even throw a recipe for that into the Ag Live newsletter. Rel relatively safe sounds a little scary. <laughs> Sketchy. I don't know if those were the words the caller used, but relatively safe. I don't know if I'd go okay. with that. It is safe. Let me put okay. it that way. 
<laughs> but it's one of those things that if you were to consume too much alcohol with some certain oh. mushrooms, oh, okay. you can release yeah. some toxicity. But that normally is not the case with the <laughs> oyster mushroom. Uh, Shelly, if someone was interested in becoming an extension agent, what advice would you give them? Oh, go for it. It's the greatest job in the whole wide world. <laughs> I put 23 years of work in with the Montana Department of Agriculture and waiting and waiting for Verlin Koenig to retire so I could take his job. Gave me the opportunity to do the research on my own to learn all the crops and learn the weeds and learn the horticulture before I applied for the position. But it, it is a great job and we work with the best people in the world. It's, I can't say enough about extension. I remember Verlin. I worked a lot with Verlin, and you've done a great job replacing him. Oh, we thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Uh, I like this question. From Boulder, are there weeds that shouldn't be composted? And how long does it take weed seeds to die if composted? That's going to vary, oh, wow. probably. Yeah, I, I would appreciate some help on this one about the <laughs> composting. As far as the weed seeds, it does, it varies from species to species. Species, uh, weeds that you wouldn't want to compost. Yeah, I, I don't know. And I don't know how common we use hot composting here in Montana, which would be one way that you would kill them. Right. So um, just passive or cold composting, I think they might survive longer, mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah, that's, that's, a, good that's a good question. So what I recommend for the master gardeners is if they're headed out, don't put them in the composter. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they're just vegetative, go ahead and put them in there. I think that's, that's probably yeah. good advice. Mm -hmm. You have what looks like an overgrown musty carrot there. What yeah, is that? That's, yeah, good call. I have, this might be a weed you wouldn't want to put in your compost. In fact, you probably wouldn't want to even handle it. This is uh, poison hemlock. And uh, it is one of the most toxic plants um, in North America. It's not native to North America. There is a native hemlock that's just as poisonous. But it has these very, um, it's really quite beautiful. It looks like a carrot leaf, actually, mm -hmm. a very divided leaf. It has a tap root. Um, I did a fairly good job getting this one out of the ground. Um, a highly toxic plant. This plant will grow five, six feet tall. It gets very tall and it gets beautiful white flowers on mm. it. It kind of looks like Queen Anne's lace yep. or you know any of the wild uh, parsnip, um, wild carrot species. Um, it is toxic to you know all mammals, including humans. And even you know handling this plant, I will be washing my hands right after the show before I would eat anything. It has to be ingested. It's not toxic, um, you know, topically to your hands, but it, it isn't. It has to be ingested, and all parts of the plant are toxic. Um, now is a great time to treat this. This this kind of grows in the understory of uh, deciduous forest. That's where I see it, or like on the field edges where you start getting into some trees and. The nice thing about it right now is it's, um, you know, it's only a couple inches tall. And where I dug this up, it's one of the only green things in the forest. So you can actually come along and, and spot treat this and not have any like off target injury to other species because it's, it's one of the only things growing right now. Um, I did want to mention too, it, it is highly toxic. We do have this publication. This is a publication that uh, the NRCS put out that some of us extension specialists worked on this and it's all about uh, plants that are poisonous to livestock in Montana and Wyoming. Has some really nice tables in the back that talk about like dosage of species like poison hemlock and how much how toxic a, a dose would be to different classes of livestock. That one can kill you. Yes. Yeah. And it, there's quite a bit of it around. To be honest. There is quite a bit of it. It, seem, it seems like the last 10 years, poison hemlock has been showing up more commonly across Montana. It likes moist areas, mm -hmm. so sometimes you'll see it growing in the draws and coolies. Yeah. And you can see it in yards at times. You can see it in yards, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Shelly, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I bring this up because we've had a couple questions about how extensive the pulse crops are in uh, the Highline region, Highline's uh, northern tier of counties. 
Um, you do a lot of work with pulses up there, correct? We do, and we actually do a lot of work with the Eastern Ag Research Center. Chensi Chen is the superintendent, and he puts in a pulse plot with some farming collaborators that I have, Dick and Darlene Fulton and Chad and Jackie Forrest, up in the Richland area, it's be North Valley County, and every year it gets larger and larger, <laughs> and every year Dick says, hmm, maybe we need to start charging, but no, it's actually uh, also funded through the, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, they provide funding for Chensi to put in the plot, and it's an amazing thing. We do have a plot tour. This year it'll be July 7th, and we're gonna invite a lot of specialists out. Unfortunately, it's the same date as the post plot uh, tour in Bozeman, but we'll probably end up inviting somebody from North Dakota State University over. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we didn't hear that. Yeah. So, <laughs> Shelly, are you trying different types of pulse crops or different cultivars of pulse crops that we know will grow here? What, what, so what all is in the they're plots? They're doing quite a few different things in the pulse plot. And, and pulse means uh, pea, chickpea, or lentil. So it's an edible legume is what a pulse is. And we have different variety trials. We're trying ones that are developed by Montana State University, Idaho, Washington. We have some private entities. Uh, that are there. We've had every single pulse breeder in the nation there with the exception of one out of Canada uh, talking about their research that they're doing. They're also doing nutrient research, they're doing disease research, all kinds of things. It's, it's a pretty impressive plot uh, and a lot of people come to it every year, generally between 50 and 120 people. And I have to give the Northern Terror Counties a lot of credit for bringing the pulse crops in there. There was a gentleman in, in uh, Malta for a long time, Mike Lang. Yep. Mike was a big promoter early on of pulse crops, especially chickpeas at the time. But that's kind of where they've taken off. And right now, uh, they really do fit in this state and do very, very nicely and been allowing us to more continuous crop. Mm -hmm. And it's been much more profitable for producers. So you guys have done a great job up on the high line. Well, thank you. It was a big learning curve, you know, when you had all of these herbicides that had residuals and knowing you know what was going on with the lentils or the peas lentils are super sensitive to any kind of herbicide so if you had something there that was residual we really struggled with learning that but once they got it down it's it's great and keeping good records is critical oh, exactly <laughs> uh, from Facebook um, is a treatment for bulbous bluegrass that Jane mentions safe for other desired grasses they are on an old river bottom, no irrigation. If we use something that kills the other desired grasses, <clears throat> we don't have the ability to irrigate new seed up, so. Yeah, that's a, a really good uh, note. Um, the, you will have other, you will have injury to other grasses. Uh, that's why one of the tricks with dealing with bulbous bluegrass is you're treating it when it's greening up because it greens up sooner than the other grasses so you can it's kind of a timing issue if it starts getting later into the season then you may have more injury to other grasses that are greening up so it, it's a timing issue to get out there early okay question from bozeman this person would like to plant their potatoes is it time this week, I might just hold back a little bit. What do you guys think? I'm usually a little bit more um, conservative with when I plant. So, I mean, we had snow today. So I would say, you know, wait. But this is a good time in general to plant potatoes. What would you say, Shelley? I agree. Uh, we They used to say that Good Friday is when you want to plant them, but that's way too early. <laughs> so uh, we just planted our yesterday, as a matter of fact. You're um, dry but, then. But we're dry and we're a bit warmer than mm -hmm. you are here. Yeah. Uh, elevation mm -hmm. is a little lower. So I would say, you know, when the soil temperatures get about 58 degrees, then is the time to plant. Um, yeah. It's and not going to do anything but sit there and you could get pests in them. Absolutely. And contact your local extension agents to find out what that timing is for where you are in the state. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, we don't have an entomologist on panel but it's from Kalispell and we'll see if anybody has an answer. Are there praying mantis in Montana and that can they live on the western side and should they? Anybody have a clue on that? 
We have them uh, in the western side. I don't think they're native, though. Um, uh, I think that they were introduced. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure 100 percent, but we do have them in the western part of the state. Eastern, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're kind of cute. They are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And our entomologist generally brings in one of her pets out of her pet. <laughs> numerous different pets. But I asked uh, Lori if she has a plain, praying mantis in captivity, and we'll bring it on sometime. Uh, we're getting a little short. I'm going to run this one by quickly here. Uh, Montana has been short of hay. We know that. We've been really short of hay. They're bringing in a lot of hay from other areas. Do that, or does that uh, present problems in some areas? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to just be really cautious about, uh, one, the weed issue. Are you bringing in new weeds? And secondly, the quality of the hay. You should probably have it tested to find out, is it good quality hay for your feed, for your forage? And also nitrates. Nitrates can be very toxic to um, cattle or any livestock, really. And some weeds, if it's really weedy hay, they will have high levels of, of nitrates, as well as the small grains, it's particularly oat hay is really susceptible to high nitrates. So take it into your extension office, have them run a nitrate test. And in reality, doing it, it um, even sending it to the lab is way less expensive than losing livestock. And uh, quality is, is only like $30, so. I agree, and we have had issues with that through the years. Not just this time, but in previous drought years throughout mm -hmm. the state. Um, for Jane, quick question. Um, this person would like to dig their weeds like dandelions. How deep do they have to dig them so they won't come back? Um, well, with like the real tap-rooted plants, I usually think two to three inches. Like a hound's tongue plant, if you can get, you know, a couple inches down into the ground. Now, I have heard people with dandelions say you have to get more than that, you know, five or six inches. But, but you can't do that with Canada thistle. You can't, can go down two it only, Well, digging really only works with plants that have a root like this, where you're getting that tap root. Uh, Canada thistle has a creeping root that's spreading all over the place, so even if you get this part of the plant, the creeping root over here will sprout and... Um, Sometimes the digging and the injury can actually uh, promote sprouting from the rest okay. of the roots. Thank you. Uh, before you wash your hands, you're not going to get any of this. <laughs> so Those are for thing. everybody else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us tonight, Shelly. Appreciate you coming down. We learned a lot. Thank you. Next week, we're going to have Malting in Montana with Jennifer O'Brien. She's the president of Montana Craft Malt. Thank you for all the calls this evening. Stay warm. It's going to be a cold night. We'll see you next week. Have a good week. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you, the friends of Montana PBS. Thank you. The programs you enjoy on Montana PBS are made possible through institutional support from both Montana State University Bozeman and the University of Montana Missoula. Montana PBS, one of the many services of Montana's university system. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, 
a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com.